While you're turning to Luke 15, let me just say what a delight it is to be back. Man, I tell you, I, I love you all the time. I'm glad every Sunday to be here, but when you leave and go to another part of the world, and especially when you just see lostness the way that we've seen it in this past week, it just makes me so delighted that the Lord has put me here in a place where people get the gospel, where people love the Lord Jesus, where it's not about us, but it's about the gospel. And uh, man, I'm just so glad to be back today. I have uh, been longing to be with you all this past week. We had a marvelous time there in Israel and retracing steps of Christ, you know, to sit on, I guess my favorite place, the south wall steps of the, the temple and know that these are the very, Jesus walked this way many times going in there. It's, it's an incredible thing, but I will tell you this, that there is a sense in which Jesus is far more present here in the Buck Run Baptist Church today than he is sitting there on those steps. That's a, that's a memory. He once was there, but you know, we are the temple of God. We are the, the living stones that he's built into the new temple. We're the new race that has sprung from the new Adam. We're the new people, uh, the new humanity, the, the kingdom of God. And what a joy to be with you in worship today. We've been talking about lostology. We're looking in Luke chapter 15 and thinking what this teaches us. These three parables that Jesus told, uh, they reveal a lot to us about uh, the heart of God. You know, anytime you see repetition in the scriptures, it, it ought to focus your attention. And here Jesus, in answer to the accusation of the Pharisees that this man receives sinners and eats with them, he just tells these three stories. Now, they're very similar, but they're also a little different. The first two are almost identical, but that third one, it expands. It's not a, it's not a sheep that's lost. It's not a coin. It's a son. And in the details that Jesus gives in the third parable, this, what you and I frequently call the parable of the prodigal son, he, he also gets us into the mind of this son who has left home. As long as he had money, he was doing fine. He, he wasn't thinking about his situation. He had been lulled into the false sense that everything was okay, but once he came face to face with his own deprivation, with his own brokenness, he, he begins to think, what, well, what do I do now? That's what I want us to think about. We've been talking about the laws of lostology. We've been talking about really the laws of lostness. Next week, we're going to start now the flip side of this coin is, well, what about the search? What do you, we need to know about searching? But I want us to think today one more time about what it, what it is to be lost. Because those of us who've been saved a long time or we've grown up in church, sometimes we forget what that's like. So just to remind you, I'm going to read just a portion. We're really using all of Luke 15 as our text. But today I just want to read the first part of this prodigal son. Remember, uh, the, the point Jesus is making, the main point is that elder brother. But I'm not preaching the main point of the text. I'm preaching what is a sub-point, but it's a sub-point that we need constantly to remind ourselves of about lostness. So beginning with verse 11, Luke 15, and Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Underline that. Think about that. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now I remind you, Jesus is the first and greatest lostologist. And he's called us to follow him in studying, searching for, and finding lost people. If these three parables are about anything, they're about lostness. A sheep, a coin, a son are lost. And Jesus is saying that what gladdens the heart of the Father is when the lost get found. So if that's what makes God glad, if it's, it's not about having a beautiful building, if it's not about having a bunch of people just merely gather, it's about going out there and searching and finding. If that's what brings the greatest joy to the heart of God, then that's what we've got to be about. And to do that, you've got to think like lost people. Laird Hamilton is a man's man. I don't know if you know who Laird Hamilton is. Anybody who knows anything about surfing certainly knows Laird Hamilton. Uh, he's now 53 years old, but he still, he, he rules the surfing world. He's, he has surfed 100-foot waves. He has invented waves of surfing. He, he invented what's called toe-in surfing. He, uh, he perfected the the, the hydrofoil. He's literally surfed for hundreds of miles at a time on a hydrofoil. Uh, and I, I saw an interview with Laird Hamilton who was asked a simple question. He said, you know, what, what has made you afraid the most? What have you had the greatest fear? Now you're talking to a guy who has been swamped by waves that are stories high and been caught in the undertow for literally moments. I've heard him describe what that's like to just be pinned underneath and the way you have to hold your breath and, and wait for that split second when you come up and gasp and go back down again. He's faced death. What would terrify many of us, uh, and I, I don't know that I would survive the terror, let alone the lack of oxygen, but Laird Hamilton has faced this on a regular basis for his entire life. But when he was asked to describe the moment that most frightened him, he told of how he was working back in the 1990s. They were filming the, the, really the terrible movie, Waterworld. I don't know if you've seen Waterworld. But he played Kevin Costner's. He was his double. And now Laird Hamilton, his wife, Gabrielle Reese, they live on Maui. And they were filming it over on, and you know, Maui is, is on the west side of the big island of Hawaii. They were filming it over on the east side of Hawaii, not far from Hilo. And they were having problems with jet skis, and they didn't have the right equipment. And Laird Hamilton said, I've got the right jet ski. And so uh, he went home to spend the night in Maui. The next morning, he left early on the jet ski that he wanted to use in the movie. 35 miles by jet ski from his house in Maui to the place where they were filming on the big island. But he said just as he left, uh, a heavy fog descended on that strait between Maui and the big island of Hawaii. And a real, real stiff wind began to blow. And 
without realizing it, he got blown way off course. He, he couldn't see any markers. He didn't have a compass or anything. He was just going by his, the feel of it. He'd, he'd gone this way many times before, but on this particular day, he, he could see no, no landmarks. He couldn't see the island. He didn't know where it was. And when the fog lifted, he realized that he was 65 miles north of Hilo, and he didn't have nearly enough fuel to get back and no one knew where he was no one would search for him there he was well you know the word well, he was lost he said the that feeling it wasn't like those adrenaline filled moments that he was so accustomed to this one was just he was isolated he was alone. He was hopeless. Turns out that he, he had a, a device on him, an emergency device that he could send a signal to the Coast Guard. And when he remembered that he had that, it gladdened his heart and it saved his life and he was found. But I thought to myself, when I saw that interview, I thought how fascinating that it, it wasn't those moments of waves crashing down on him, those moments where he, he had something to fight that scared him. It was a moment where there was just simply the sheer realization that he was helpless. There was literally nothing he could do. I want you to think about that. Imagine what it feels to be lost. That's the way the prodigal finds himself. He's run out of all the resources. He's, he's run through it rather quickly. And... When he comes to that moment, it says he began to be in need. There's nothing he can do. He, oh, he tries to solve it himself. But the only job he can come up with is feeding pigs, which would be about the worst job for a young Jewish man imaginable. And then one day, it says he came to himself. And he began to think what he would say. Now, I told you in previous weeks that a lot of times when we share the gospel with people that they're not necessarily in a place where they're willing or really ready to hear it. They're like the prodigal and they've still got money in their pocket. They've not yet come to the place where they realize their need. They have not come to themselves. And a lot of evangelism is really positioning yourself in somebody's life so that when they do reach that moment, they say, oh, here's what I'll do. You see that? That's what the prodigal said. Here's what I'll do. And he began to rehearse in his mind what he could do in order to have that need met. If you're, you and I are going to be lostologists, we, we've got to put ourselves in that moment. And think about it. Around us, when somebody's lost, last resort, what do they do? Last resort, if you're lost, you, we hate to admit it, we don't like to bring ourselves to it, but we ask directions. Now, when people ask directions, they don't show their true feelings. I guarantee you, if Tanya and I are in a car, if you could observe on the outside of that car and you see Tanya and me pull up to a certain to a, a service station or a convenience store and you see me get out of that car and go ask directions. <laughs> a lot has happened prior to that moment, I assure you. Right? Now, when I get out of that car and go ask directions, I've got two objectives. One is to find where I need to go, and two is to make sure they don't see what I'm really feeling. Right? I'm not going to go in there and fall down and grab some clerk's legs and say, please tell me how to get where I need to be. Let's say that I'm late for a preaching engagement. And I'm supposed to be there 20 minutes ago. I don't know where the place is. I'm picturing these people. They're wondering, where, 
where is Dr. York? We invited him to come. He agreed to come. He's not here. And I'm picturing all of that, and that's going in my mind. I'm not going to tell that, right? When I go in and ask directions, I'm not going to tell them all that's going on in my mind. I'm not going to rehearse for them why I need to know and how I'm late. I'm not going to talk about the conversation that we have had in the car. When I ask for directions, I'm always calm, but that is never what I'm feeling. You know, can you imagine? I go in and ask directions, and as I go back out to my car, people say, wow, wasn't he calm and controlled as he asked directions? No, nobody's Nobody's saying that because it's not that remarkable to them because, you know, my calm demeanor is masking a smoldering volcano of emotions. Don't push me when I am in that state. (laughs) But, you know, and that's the thing. People don't think about it. When somebody walks in the store and asks directions, someone stops you in your front yard while you're mowing and they ask directions, you tell them what they want. You don't even think about it. But I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus always was looking behind what the person said. Nicodemus comes to him in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, the great teacher of Israel, the most learned rabbi in Israel comes to Jesus. First of all, he comes at night. And he begins with a compliment. Rabbi, we know that you are sent from God because nobody could do the things that you do unless God sent him. Jesus, Jesus doesn't go, oh, shucks. Oh, man, thank you, Nicodemus. You are so gracious and so kind. Jesus knows what's going on behind Nicodemus' statement. And he says to him, hey, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He goes right to it, right to what they need. Think about the Samaritan woman. Jesus begins to talk to her. She's talking around it. When he begins to push her about her sin, she wants to talk about religion. Oh, well, the Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem, and our fathers say this mountain. What do you think it is? Jesus is looking behind what she's saying. You see, this is what you've got to learn to do. When, When people talk to you about things of the Lord, when people are willing to engage you in a conversation about something that's happening in their life, You've got to understand, even when people come to church, people don't come to church, you know, instead of their own activities. There's a lot of stuff people could do. If somebody just shows up in church on Sunday morning, instead of doing the stuff that they could be doing somewhere else, well, it tells you there's something going on there. If they come a second time, something is definitely going on. If if people that really aren't in church, come to church. If people at your job ask you about church, there's something happening. Think about the question signal. If they ask you any question that has to do with spiritual matters, listen, I don't care how busy you are, I don't care what's going on. If someone asks you something about spiritual matters, you, you drop whatever you're doing, you talk to them about it. The, the church attendance signal. If they come to church, if someone says to you, hey, Do you mind if I go to church with you or someone that lives on your street or someone you once did business with? You see them at church. You've never seen them before. You make sure that you you talk to them. They're sending a signal. They're the Christian literature signal. Someone says to you, you know, I've been reading this book called The Purpose Driven Life. Or, you know, know, I, I was reading the Bible the other day. Man, if someone says that to you, you drop whatever you're doing. You talk to them. They're sending you a signal. Someone says, you know, I was reading, I saw this TV, this preacher on TV the other day, and he said something. Anytime someone is opening a door like that about spiritual things, even, even if they've been misguided, even if someone says something wrong, but they want to talk to you about it, you talk to them. Sometimes they come to maybe your community group, or they know that you're hanging out with a bunch of other believers, and they want to come. They're floating a trial balloon. Do they fit? Will they be accepted? They come to you and talk about their marriage or their cancer. 
there's sort of a hopeful hopelessness, if I can use that oxymoron. That they, they're in a hopeless situation, but they, they're hopeful. You can give them hope. Whatever you're doing, drop it. Because when people ask you for some direction, they're not revealing their true emotions. You don't see what's going on below the surface. But now here's the thing. We often forget directions are always confusing. So if someone does ask you directions, hey, uh, you know, my wife and I, we've been having problems. and You know, we just don't know what to do. That's a signal. But the question is, how do you respond? I, I, directions are just always confusing. How many of you, how many of you know Frankfurt pretty well? How many of you know Frankfurt pretty well? Know how to get around in Frankfurt? All right. Now, I speak as one who came to Frankfurt. I, Al Moeller and I, one time, long before I was pastor here at Buck Run, we were supposed to speak at the Capitol. We came over from, from Louisville, and we got lost in Frankfurt for 30 minutes. We could see the Capitol Dome. But between the river and one-way streets, he was pushing OnStar, man. He was like, hey, how do I get there? And they're saying, you've got to go down the street. He said, we can't. It's one way coming this way. It, it, you know, directions are always confusing. All right, now, if you're from Frank Frankfurt, this makes sense to you. Let me tell you how to get to my house from here. All right, from here. Okay? So you just go out the driveway and you turn right on well, this is Highway 421. It's called Lee's Town Road here. You're going to turn right, and you're going to go up the road. Now, you stay on this road, but it quits being 421 <laughs> and becomes the east-west connector. Are you with me? Just stay straight, but you're on a different road. And you stay on the east-west connector. I say stay straight, but it does this weird curve stay on it and when you get to Martin Luther King Boulevard you turn right and it's going to take you you're going to start you're going to go up right on north on Martin Luther King Boulevard it, now it's going to dead end into East Main you'll see Kentucky State University right in front of you you want to take a left there you're going to go down the hill that you're on East Main now and it's going to go down the hill, and there's going to be a stoplight at the bottom of the hill. You're going to see a bridge on your left. That's Capitol. You're going to turn left on Capitol. You're going to cross that bridge, and, uh, and there's going to be a real short little block on the other side of that bridge, and there's a stoplight on 2nd Street. You're going, to st you're going to turn right on 2nd Street. All right, you're going to go one block, and that's Shelby. You're going to turn left on Shelby. I'm the first house on the right. Now, if you don't want to go that way, <laughs> you can stay on the east-west connector. Don't turn right on Martin Luther King Boulevard. Just stay on the east-west connector until you cross the Kentucky River on the Julian Carroll Bridge, and then you can turn right there on River Road. You turn right on River Road, you're going to think you're out in the middle of nowhere, but you're not. You're right in the middle of Frankfurt. And so you're going to drive under the parking garage for the Kentucky State Capitol and just go right through it. You'll see Cliffside and smell the burgers and onion rings on the left, but <laughs> you keep going. Don't be sidetracked. It's going to do a, a dog leg turn to the left. You stay right on it and cross Capitol and get to Shelby and turn right. Now, We've got some guests here today from New Hampshire. I'm, I tell you, Keith Lewis could no more get to my house from here on the, based on those directions. I mean, if I said, okay, Keith, I told you two ways to get to my house. You're on your own now. Go get in your car and do it. You think he'd get there? He would not get there. He would not get there. Why? Directions are always confusing. And you, you throw the Kentucky River snaking through Frankfurt. You, you throw the one-way streets in. Man, it's hard. And direction givers always struggle with how to tell people where to go all the time. 
You know, first of all, direction givers assume that people who are lost know more than they do. It's hard for me, having lived in Frankfurt now for 14 years, to put myself back to a zero knowledge point of reference. Right? So, you know Frankfurt. When I just gave directions to my house, if you know Frankfurt, it made perfect sense to you. You could, you could follow me in your mind's eye the whole way. But if you don't know Frankfurt, Keith and his wife sat over here in this, and I guarantee you it made no sense to them. It, they couldn't picture a thing. Why? Because they've got a zero point of reference. They've never been here before. When we tell lost people the gospel, sometimes we forget that they're not where we are and they don't, they don't have some knowledge that we've had for many, many years. What direction givers often say really is an approximation of reality. So someone says, give me directions to, you know, McDonald's. You pull out, you say, well, there, let me draw it out on a napkin. Does, you, does your little map going to be to scale? It's not going to be to scale. Is it going to have all the details? It's not going to have all the details. See, we underestimate the difficulty of getting to partic a particular destination. We, and you know what we say? Oh, you want to get to my house? Oh, it's easy. We start with, oh, it's easy. And then we tell them, and they're listening, and they're going, yeah, this is, this is not easy. This is anything but easy. This doesn't make sense to me. I, I have no frame of reference. So we tell somebody, oh, the gospel is simple. Well, it is. But if, if, if you don't have any reference of creation, the fall, of sin, of who Jesus is, then it doesn't sound simple. Sometimes we underestimate the difficulty of getting to a particular destination. We say, oh, oh, it's easy. You just do this. You know, the Pharisees were probably a well-intentioned group, but they were dead wrong. They, they majored in giving people spiritual directions, and they complicated it. They loaded it up. Their, their complex systems became impossible to follow. And there are a lot of churches today just like it, where we're laying burdens on people. Instead of remembering that Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. You'll find rest for your souls. We, we make it hard. Jesus, man, from the beginning, people knew Jesus was different. He wasn't going around laying burdens on them. He, he spoke to people in a language they understood. He told stories. He wrapped spiritual messages in everyday images. He, he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. See, don't assume that they know anything about the Bible. If you do, then often all you're doing, remember one of our first laws of law is just is because you're lost doesn't mean you're stupid. But sometimes the way we give people spiritual directions is we imply to them that they're stupid. Oh, you don't know this? Oh, this is basic. Well, it may be basic to you. You grew up in it. But we've got to understand not everybody has that Judeo-Christian background. Even people have grown up right here. And so when you are telling people the gospel, don't use insider talk or jargon. Oh, brother, you just need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Well, now, nobody believes that more than I do. And I like singing songs that make people go, what's that about? But when I'm talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I, I don't want to use any kind of insider jargon that makes no sense to them because they don't have any kind of a biblical reference point. Don't inundate them. Don't give people more than they are ready for. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, sexuality and 
what's happening in our world about sexuality and marriage. But you know, if someone comes to me, someone, let's say they're in a sinful heterosexual relationship, man and woman living together without being married, or they're in a homosexual relationship, my first concern is not about their sexuality. That's like, man, that's pretty far down the list. My first concern is that they understand their brokenness. You know, we're all broken in different ways. So see, that's where I've got to start. I've got to start with God's design. God has a design. God has a plan. But man, look, our lives are broken. We've departed from God's design and God's plan. And to whatever degree our lives are departed from the plan God has and intends for us, there's brokenness. We might have brokenness in our marriages. We might have brokenness in our sexuality. We might have brokenness in our greed, our temper. Brokenness can show itself in many, many different ways, but that's where I've got to begin. I, if you just inundate people and you begin at really points that are much further down the, the road, those come later. The, the key issue is whether or not you understand your brokenness and God's willingness and ability to make you whole. And sometimes when you're talking to people, people who are lost, like the Samaritan woman, they'll bring up something. It's like you'll be talking to them, and they're going to ask you a question that has, seems like it has nothing to do with anything. Like you're, you're sharing with them about how to have eternal life, and they'll say, well, let me ask you something. Is it wrong to eat catfish? And you're like, what? Look, don't misunderstand. Don't be concerned with irrelevant questions. The Samaritan woman asked Jesus an irrelevant question. Nicodemus, what did he do? Uh, he, he sort of took Jesus' statement and and went overboard with it. Oh, what should I do? Should I, am, I, am I supposed to enter into my mother's womb even though I'm an old man? Don't, don't be put off by people asking irrelevant questions. That's just what they do. But understand that unnecessary details make directions even more confusing. When, when we begin to share the gospel... You know, you, you've got to be able to tell them what, what matters is that the prodigal knows how to get home. I'm not going to talk to the prodigal about what it's going to be like to deal with his elder brother. I'm not going to talk to him about what it's going like to be like to, to get back into life there on his dad's farm. No, I'm going to talk to him about how to get home. Sometimes uh, eager direction givers, they... You know, they, they give unnecessary details. They make it even more confusing. Here, I'll draw you a little map. Did you notice when I went through my directions earlier how I did that? I was like, oh, well, this is 421, but it turns into the east-west connector. And, and I talked to you about which way they can go. But, may, you know, oh, now, do you want to go the most direct route or do you want the scenic route? And we begin to load up all these unnecessary details. Oh, well, while you're going, you might as well stop here. This is a really neat place to have lunch. And, you know, nice, nice people, accurate directions, helpful bits of information. But the truth is, a lost, someone who's lost just needs directions of how to get home. So you've got to give the truth in the right dosage. And you do that by sticking to the gospel. Because the gospel always deals with the heart of the matter first. Now let me digress for just a moment so you get this. When I talk to somebody about the gospel, I want to make sure they understand gospel basics. That's what we must know. All right, to be saved. What is it that a person has to know to be saved? They have to know that they're lost. They have to know who Jesus is. They have to know about his death, burial, and resurrection. Those are gospel basics. 
Now, you could also talk about gospel demands. These are the things that, these are what we must do. And there, is, there are demands of the gospel that people need to know up front. Repentance is one of them. I'm never going to share the gospel with somebody without expressing that you must repent. Jesus is not merely a fire escape. We're not talking about, oh, you can, you can trust Jesus and then keep your sin and you're still okay. No, there are gospel demands. Later, after a person comes to know Christ, they begin to think through what I call gospel implications. That's the steady advance of the gospel into our lives. Maybe, all right, now that I've trusted Christ, maybe I work someplace I, I shouldn't work. Maybe I'm part of an industry that is antithetical to the gospel. I mean, if, someone, if I led someone who worked at Planned Parenthood to Christ, do I think that there are going to be gospel implications about where they work? Oh, I do. I do. But am I going to begin there? No. That's, that's not the gospel. That's a gospel implication. That's something people have to sort through after they put their faith in Christ. And then there are gospel convictions. Sometimes the gospel even leads me to have a conviction about things that I don't think necessarily other people have to have. Those are decisions we make as we mature in the gospel. But when someone comes to us in their lostness and they begin to ask those questions, they show us a little glimpse of their brokenness. Maybe they're hiding their emotions, but the fact that they're asking, the fact that they're bringing up, they're, they're saying, in essence, I'm lost, can you help me? Means that nothing else in my life at that moment is more important. Now, why, don't, why am I emphasizing this, folks? Because too often, those of us who know Christ think evangelism is putting a sign up in front of the church and saying, hey, you guys are welcome to come here. But that is not what God's called us to do. There are people in your life that no one else can reach. No one else can get to them. You are there. God has placed you there. And if you begin to look at them the way Jesus looks at them and see their lostness, you get a burden for them. The Spirit begins to work in you and to bring their face to your mind when you pray and to hear, let your ears hear the comments that they make and look for opportunities to steer the gospel into your conversation, to steer that conversation into an area where you can tell them what they need to know. See, sensitivity to, to people and to the Spirit is absolutely essential. But you're not going to be sensitive to the Spirit if you don't get eyes for lostness. But furthermore, if you want to see people come to faith in Christ, you're going to have to be yielded yourself. How can you be asking God to work in the lives of people around you to bring your lost family members, your neighbors, your co-workers to a saving knowledge of Christ if you yourself really aren't willing to just say yes to him, whatever he wants, in your baptism, your, your obedience, your marriage, your church membership, whatever it might be, sensitivity to the Spirit begins with submission to the Spirit. I want you to bow your head right now. And I want to ask you, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, just, just you and God, what is God requiring of you that you're withholding from Him? Is there an area of obedience that you've not totally surrendered to Him? Oh, more than anything, I want Buck Run to be a place, a, a, a beacon that shines a light to lostness that says, this is the way home. We want you to come here, but that's not going to happen 
unless we are yielded to the Spirit of God, unless we are sensitive to people and to the Spirit, and that begins with our own submission to Him. But I know this morning that as I have preached primarily to saved people, about lost people, there are some today, right here in this very room, who are yourselves lost. I don't know what you know. I don't know if you understand the degree of your brokenness and alienation from God. I don't know if you know who Jesus is, that he's the Son of God, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on Calvary's cross to pay the penalty of your sins so you could be made right with God. I don't know if you understand that he rose from the dead to conquer death and sin for you. I don't know if you know that if you'll repent of your sins and put your faith in him, that he'll save you. But if you know that, do that. If you say, well, I, I know I need that. I know my life is broken, but I, I don't know how to do that. In a moment, when we sing, pastors of this church are going to be here in the front. And if you'll just come take one of them by the hand and say, I, I want to know how to be found. I want to know how to be saved. I, I want to know that I'm no longer lost. Put in your own words, they'll know what you mean. But if you'll just come, take one of them by the hand, they'll take you to a private place and they'll just take as much time as you need to tell you how you can know that you've been found. But perhaps you're a believer. God's placing someone on your heart. You need to come pray for that person. God's shown you some area of disobedience in your life. You need to get right with God. Church membership, baptism, whatever it is. Father, I pray that in a moment when we sing, that all over this sanctuary, your people will be doing business with you, yielding, surrendering, confessing, repenting, trusting, believing, obeying, whatever the need may be. I pray that those that are here who are lost might indeed come to themselves and that your spirit will show them the way home. Oh, how I pray that you'll move right now in Jesus' name. Amen.